You didn't build a great business by being timid. And now it's time to get back to business the same way you built it, with passion. UBS is here with the resources and knowledge you need today. We've weathered the storm with business owners for more than 150 years. And what we've learned can help you right now, not just for your own personal goals, for your business. With insights and strategies to help you get up and running with the focus and determination that made you a success in the first place. It's a matter of asking the right questions and speaking with the right people who can help you find the solutions to move your business forward. With UBS, the possibilities are endless, but the focus is always on you, your family, and your business. Why not benefit from all of the knowledge and resources available to you from UBS? Few people could have built what you built. Proceed with passion. Welcome everyone um, from wherever you're logging on. I'm Shirley Leung and I'm a columnist at the Boston Globe. This is the Leadership Lunch Series sponsored by UBS. Today's session is on how to elevate women of color, strategies and tips from three amazing female leaders of color, YW Boston CEO, Beth Chandler, Suffolk Construction Vice President, Linda Dorsina Fori, and Mass Inc. Chief Operating Officer, Juana Matias. Um, and uh, COVID has created a new sense of urgency uh, around retaining and advancing women of color uh, at organizations. Last month, McKinsey issued its annual Women in the Workplace report and found women, especially women of color, are more likely to have been laid off during the pandemic. Black women are also being disproportionately affected by the virus. They are more than twice as likely as women overall to say that a death of a loved one has been one of their biggest challenges during the pandemic. Racial strife and violence are also exacting a heavy emotional toll. McKinsey has found that black women are less likely than women overall to ask for accommodation from a manager and fewer than one in three black women report their manager has checked in on them in light of difficult times or fostered inclusive culture uh, on their team. But before we begin, and what we hope will be a frank and eye-opening conversation, we're gonna hear some remarks from our sponsor. Here is Brittany Manganaro, branch manager of, at UBS's Wellesley office. Shirley, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As Shirley said, my name is Brittany Manganero, and I'm the branch manager for UBS in Wellesley. I work with our UBS financial advisors to provide financial advice, guidance, and services for our clients and their families' well-being, especially during this uncertain time. Uh, we're looking forward to being part of such an important conversation today with Beth Chandler, Linda Dorsana Fori. Juana Matias and moderated by, by Shirley Leung, uh, columnist at the Boston Globe. Uh, these leaders have charted ground groundbreaking paths across various industries and have dedicated their careers to advocating for the importance of learning and listening from female leaders and how we can elevate women of color. We wanna thank Shirley and the Globe for their continued work and dedication and bringing together our local leaders to discuss topics that are relevant to the greater Boston community and creating such a strong platform to shed light on these crucial and pivotal workplace matters. At UBS, we acknowledge that the face of wealth is changing and becoming more gender balanced. At some point in their lives, eight in 10 women will end up alone and solely responsible for their financial well being, which is why it's so important for all women to be supported in their financial independence. Increasing diversity, especially within financial services, is a strategic priority. We strive to encourage other organizations locally within the Boston community and beyond to set up programs to encourage the advancement of women of color and to learn from women such as our speakers today. We're looking forward to hearing our speakers' thoughts and insights on this incredibly timely topic. So please join us in welcoming their remarks. Thanks, Shirley. Thank you, Brittany. 
And thank you, UBS, for your continued sponsorship. So we're going to do a little, a little bit different format today. We're going to shake it up a little bit. Uh, many women, especially Black and Latino women, face barriers in the workplace. And during the first half, I'm going to talk to Beth, Linda, and Juana individually, because each has a unique story to tell. And then everyone will come together in the second half of the panel to answer questions from the audience. Uh, we've received some great pre-submitted questions uh, from the audience. And if anyone in the audience now wants to ask a question during the panel, please use your Q&A function during the Zoom. The chat function has been turned off. So first up is Beth Chandler. Let's see. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Welcome, Beth. Hi. Hi, uh, Shirley. <laughs> so uh, Beth has been the CEO of YW Boston since 2018. She has over 20 years of experience in the nonprofit and corporate worlds. She's a former professional basketball player, and she's also, she also went to Harvard and has an MBA from Columbia Business School. Beth, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, so I was hoping you could talk about how you were able to crack the glass ceiling in the nonprofit world. You know, was there a pivotal turning point for you? Sure, it's a great question. And I, I knew it was coming. Um, and I was thinking about it this weekend. And I, I thought, you know, there were so many times in my career where I was never asked. Um, so many people around me, white women, men, um, were always asked when positions were opened up in organizations that I was in and no one ever asked me. And it got me, I think, to think that somehow I, I wasn't qualified, I, I wasn't able um, to take on different roles. And it wasn't, it was really what was pivotal for me was when uh, my, my predecessor, Sylvia Farrell Jones, uh, stepped down from YW. And uh, at the time the board wasn't sure, we didn't have a succession plan. And our board chair, Tello, said, you know, I think you can do this. Um, I wanna put your name forward as being the interim. I would like you to be the interim, you know, executive director for YW Boston. And that was really, you know, a critical or pivotal time for me because up until then, um, I hadn't thought about, you know, taking the role as a CEO or executive director. And it wasn't until Mim said, hey, I think you can do this, that I said, hey, I think I, think I can too. Um, but it really took, you know, her saying that because my previous experience had always been there was something not quite right about me. I remember my uh, first role uh, in an investment bank and my manager, the conversation when I went into his office, I was thinking he was going to tell me what I needed to do, what skills would be important. And all he talked about was how my hair needed to look different, how I needed to dress a certain way, how I needed to have my, my nails. And it was all to look like somebody who wasn't me. Uh, and so it was very clear to me at that point, you know, that there was something wrong at that organization um, for me to think about being successful because what I was bringing to the table wasn't going to be enough. So what do you say when a supervisor comments about your looks or how you should change your looks rather than um, your skills? <laughs> what is the, what, how do you respond to that? You know, I mean, I, <laughs> My response then was not to say much of anything, but to look around me and to see that I was not going to be successful in that institution because there was no one who looked like me who was in a senior leadership role. Mm -hmm. um, so that for me was enough to say I needed to think about leaving because I was only going to get so far. Um, and, you know, that's really the impetus for why YW approaches the work the way that it does. When we were looking at doing our work differently and having a, a different focus uh, three years ago, you know, up until then, a lot of the work that was happening was on, you know, what do we need to do? What do organizations need to do to help women of color, to help others in marginalized groups be successful, right? How do you change them? What, you know, was a deficit-based model. Right? And our approach was, wait a minute, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with people of color. There's nothing wrong with women of color. There's nothing wrong with LGBTQ people. What's wrong are the cultures of organizations. So how do we help organizations change their culture so everybody can be successful? And so now, you know, if I, I, I don't know if anybody would actually say that to me today, it's still possible. Um, and I think my pushback would be, you know, let's, let's take a look at your organization and who's successful 
and how do they look and how much difference do you have both by perspective, by race, by ethnicity, by you know, any category. Um, and if there's not much difference in your organization, then the problem is your organization, not me. Mm -hmm. And so going back to your, your work at the Y, um, what is, you know, you've, you've doubled down on fighting racism, uh, apparent, empowering women of color. So what, what, are, what is the biggest barrier in, in, uh, to women of color becoming leaders? I mean, you talked a little bit about culture, a culture change. Right. Um, and, and what is the most effective way to lift them up? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest challenge is that people have a hard time accepting that women of color can be leaders. Um, and I think this came up in the debate. Uh, you know, a lot of the follow up for the vice presidential debate was around Senator Kamala Harris and how she was, you know, fighting both as a woman and a woman of color and how people would perceive her. So could she really, you know, stick up for herself without being perceived as aggressive? Right. When a man does it and a white man, it's he's being assertive. He's taking initiative and a black woman in particular, it's oh, she's being overly aggressive or she's being hostile. So I think, you know, women of color have to fight this perception of when they do something, there's a negative light cast to it versus somebody in a majority group or an advantage group doing the same behavior and has positive language. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for organizations to really think about that within their cultures. And when they are you know, looking at uh, doing reviews of people, are, are they equitable, right? Are they using the same terminology when um, women and women of color are being evaluated? Are people really looking at the skills and the outcomes of the work as opposed to other things that you can't quantify? Like I, I had somebody ask me once about, uh, once about cultural fit. Well, who defines culture, right? That to me is a euphemism for how do we keep others out? Um, so it's really looking at, you know, what's your data saying for who's advancing in your organization? And if you're not seeing people advancing at, you know, equitable levels, then what's going on in your process that's disadvantaging people? So one last question for me before we move on to Linda. So I want to go back to your first answer about um, how you were never asked. When you look back at your career, you were never asked you know, for a promotion or for a role until right. MIM came along. And now you're the CEO of YW. So when you look back, what would have happened to you if you had been asked earlier in your career? I have no idea. And I'm not one that looks backwards in that way, I, you know, because who knows? Um, but I have certainly learned from those experiences. I certainly, you know, I have a son and a daughter and I talk to them about, you know, how can they take more agency in their careers, in their lives? I mean, they're 13 and 10, so they don't have careers. <laughs> and thinking about their lives, like how can they take agency? How can they do it in a way um, that is going to be positive for them and to help really shape their, their, their experience, whether it's in school or outside of? Um, and so I think I may have, you know, asserted myself a little differently. Um, I also think it was a little more challenging because of how women and particularly women of color are and still are perceived. Um, and so wanting to also be mindful of, you know, how do I be assertive, but not viewed as aggressive, right, which is often off putting to people. Um, I tend to be direct, that's not always well received. And so, you know, trying to figure out what is the culture, how can I nudge it you know, a bit and be more assertive about the things that I want in a way that can be respected within that institution and, you know, ensure that I'm not holding myself back. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Beth. We're, uh, we're going to see you uh, in, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Uh, <laughs> so uh, next up is Linda Dorsina Forey. Linda, you want to turn on your camera? Hi, Linda. Hey, Shirley. How are you? I'm good, thanks. So Linda is the Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations at Suffolk Construction, since, also since 2018. I noticed that everybody's bio, something dramatic <laughs> happened to you guys in 2018. You'll, you'll see that about Juana too. Anyways, before that, uh, Linda was in the state legislature for about a dozen years representing Dorchester, Mattapan, and South Boston. She was first as a, as a state representative and then as a state senator. Uh, when she left Beacon Hill, she was the highest ranking elected black official in Massachusetts. 
Massachusetts. So my first question is about politics, which remains very white and very male dominated. Um, women make up only 28% of the legislature on Beacon Hill. Um, I mean, that means progressive Massachusetts uh, is no better than the national average. So was it a difficult decision for you to run for office? And, and why do you think you were able to break through? Well, first, Shirley, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. I'm glad to join Beth and Juana. I um, look forward to our conversation later um, as a group. Um, I'll first say that for me, you know, I ran for almost um, for office almost 16 years ago, which is unbelievable, right? A long time. And at that time, you know, I worked in both state and municipal government for nine years, right? Focusing on issues on strengthening families and, uh, you know, small businesses and home ownership. And even with all of that, Right. With all that experience, you know, I did not think that I would run for office. Really amazing. Right. Um, nine years in government. And it really took me a, a while to make the decision. And I'll say this um, back then. Right. It's not like 22, 2020 or even five to seven years ago where a lot of women are running for office, which is wonderful. But 16 years ago, there wasn't that many of us doing that. And studies have shown the Barbara Lee Foundation in particular put out a study that said you had to ask women at least seven times to run for office before we decided to do it. And so in 2004, 2005, it was a special election. You had to ask me a couple of times, you know, to say, hey, you know, you, I have the experience. I know that, but I, I didn't think, you know, that people would have voted for me, right? How do I go about in doing that? So for me, it was a lot of um, support. It was a lot of encouragement. In particular, uh, you know, Bill Forey, who's my husband, was like, of course you can do this. You know, you have the experience. You've done this work, but you've done more than this, right? And so, you know, we began, you know, I ran. I ran. I was also had a young family. You know, my son, John, um, was 14 months old um, then. Yesterday was his birthday. Happy birthday, John. He turned 17 years old. Wow. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable, right? But as, a, as I was in office and as I decided to run and we put, I mean, really, I ran hard and that's what it is, right? Running to serve and when, running to support communities. But I served for eight, eight years, you know, in the state house as a state rep and had three additional children while in office. And so when the state Senate seat came up. So the first round you had to kind of, you know, push me along to get into the race. When the special Senate seat came and when I was a state rep, it was a city suburban district. I represented Milton as well. But when the Senate seat opened up, you know, I was like, that's my seat, right? I served eight years. I was chair of small business and community development, worked on serious policies to support, you know, um, small businesses around the Commonwealth, you know, the economic backbone, right, of Massachusetts, and really to do things differently. And so when the Senate opened, I was like, that's my seat. No one had to convince me I'm going to do it. But um, yeah, it, it took a while. But I think that this is where, you know, having women run now, you know, you don't have to ask us, right? We are running and we are running in record numbers all over the country, not just here in Massachusetts. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, but really being able to see those that came before, right? To set the path is important. And, and that's what I was able to see when I first ran. So you're in the construction business now, another white male dominated sector. And, you know, women of color, can struggle to bring their whole selves to work. I mean, um, uh, we heard a little bit of that from Beth. So, and, and, and sometimes that can be a source of dissatisfaction in the workplace. Uh, and so do you bring your whole self to work and, and how can women of color make organizations accept them for who they are? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I bring my whole self to work, right? I'm, I, every day, um, because, you know, you can't really disconnect who you are, right? Whether you're a woman of color or not, right? Or women in general, right? We are who we are. And I think it is important where, you know, you're able to work in an environment that accepts that and allows the voices to be heard. And I can tell you that, yes, um, construction sector in general, right? It, it is a male dominated field, um, but it's been quite an amazing experience at Suffolk, right? We have um, in, in John Fish, the founder, um, incredible executive team that believes in building a people 
and believe in the power of people. And so we've done a lot of work around allowing um, the space and the place for people to be able to share who they are. I can tell you that in the company Suffolk in particular, you know, there's about eight people on the executive lead, maybe seven in the executive leadership, two are women, um, which is wonderful, right? A, a man of color as well is on the leadership team. And so, uh, yeah, I bring myself to work all the time. I think that is the way you can only do, right? In terms of doing that, but also with my team. You know, it's bringing yourself to work, but it's also with the people that you work with being authentic and before starting a meeting, just asking people how they're feeling, right? There's a lot going on right now, a lot of issues that folks are bringing into work. And so it, it's really important to do that. But yeah, I, I'm enjoying where I am and, and it's pretty cool. That's great. I mean, one of the things that women of color, uh, especially in, at your level, I mean, you're often the one of the onlys in the room, right? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, one of, of a handful of women or perhaps the only woman or perhaps the only woman of color. And there's a certain discomfort to that. So how do you, I mean, do you ever feel doubted by your peers, you know, whether it's in politics or in your business circles and, and how do you overcome that? How do you deal with that? that oh, Shirley, that's a great question. So I'm gonna say this, right? Um, it's interesting. So I am a black woman. I am first generation American, right? My parents came here from Haiti. So no doubt there were rooms that I have gone into whether I was elected or before being elected and even to today where I may be the only person of color in the room. And I hold my head up high because I belong in that room, right? And so that's always been the way um, that I've thought of you know, my work or who I am, because I think of my parents' experience coming here not speaking English and only in this great country that their daughter can become elected, right? And become a state senator. And only here that, you know, through the hard work that, you know, my parents instilled in me and my faith as a Catholic, you know, it's really bringing people to the table. And yet it is uncomfortable, but I walk in rooms and this is my room. Right, so I'd love to see more people of color and this is what we strive for as we create the opportunity and really creating the pipeline, you know, to allow the voices to be at the table, which is so, so important. But I, I, I always, when I would speak to college students and high school students, you know, just in the classrooms, and that's one thing I would say, be proud of who you are, you know, cause so many people came before us, so many struggles, and yet we're still facing it today in 2020, aren't we? When we look at the social injustices that are happening, the systemic racisms that are happening, and we are trying to tackle that as a company. And everyone's talking about it now in this space in 2020, um, as we think of inequities, as we think of opportunities, as we think about access, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, right? So that's been quite a transformative moment, you know, for us um, here in Massachusetts, but really the country, and how are we going to really start speaking up and really opening our eyes when we're in spaces. Now, not as people of, now I'm saying the majority, white people, right? As you're in spaces and you're putting events together, you need to look around the room. And if there are not people around the table, then something is wrong. And so it's how do you think about it differently? How do we start doing the work and being intentional to make sure we can get voices there? Thank you, Linda. We've run out of time, but, but we'll hear from you in a few more minutes. We're, we're, thank you, Linda, for your thoughts. We're going to go to Juana next. And then in a few minutes, we'll bring everybody back. Hi, Juana. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. So great to be here with you and the yeah. workers of Beth and Linda. Thank you so much for the invitation. So, so Juana is the Chief Operating Officer at Mass Inc. That's the Public Policy Research and Polling Group. Uh, previously, she was the first Latina immigrant woman elected to the state legislature. In 2018, she became the first Latina to run for Congress and came damn close, uh, despite having been outspent by uh, almost everyone else in the race. So um, you were a first term. I have another politics question to start out with for you. You were in your first term as state rep right? And uh, you decided to run for Congress. I mean, that's chutzpah. <laughs> so, so how did you come to that decision? Look, as you know, Shirley, um, women are always told that we need to wait our turn. In 2016, when I decided to run for state rep, I was told that it was not my turn yet, and that I should start off at the city council level or school committee level. When I decided in 2018 uh, to embark on the congressional race, I was told the same thing. And also a question, why aren't you running for state Senate instead? 
Um, I've seen time and time again, others setting the bar too low for women of color. And I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you, Charlie. It was probably one of the hardest decisions I've made um, to jump into that congressional race. But there were a couple of reasons why I did so. The first was my commitment to public service, both in 2016 and 2018. I believed I represented the community of Lawrence, a community with extreme high need, uh, impacted by very complex policy issues. And I felt that Lawrence deserved an adequate, effective, passionate representative, and that I no longer was gonna sit on the sidelines. So I challenged a long-term sitting incumbent and won that race. And really, I think my story relates a lot to Beth and also uh, Linda's, where while I was thinking in 2016 about running, I had to be pushed by others. I questioned myself, there was doubt. There I was in a library doing a list of pros and cons. And the cons were, well, how about if I lose? And could I really mount a campaign against an incumbent? Those were the challenges I faced. And then when I embarked in the congressional race, that was an even bigger monster. Uh, I had someone reach out to me and plant the seed. They said, Juana, there's a vacancy and you should be thinking about it. And my initial thoughts were like, really me, could I? Should I? Uh, a couple of days went by and the idea had internalized and I thought, of course I should. Here I had been serving this district for years as a social worker, then representing unaccompanied minors and now as a state representative. Um, and I'm gonna be going up against people who have never run for office or held office. And so, although there were a lot of challenges that I was gonna face, um, I embarked on it. And I was really lucky that I had an organization by the name of New Politics I said, we're gonna be right by your side as you continue to move forward with this race. Look, it wasn't an easy decision. I also looked at the numbers. Anyone who tells you they're running for office and they did, don't do an assessment of how you get to a win number is lying to you. And for me, here I was. I represented the second largest voting block in the third congressional district. And I knew my community would come out again for me um, and knew that we had a path to a win number. However, I also knew that I would face a huge obstacle, raising funds, right? I didn't come from a network of wealthy uh, friends or a network of uh, wealthy family members. And um, I somehow convinced myself that it was like jumping off a cliff and figuring it out as I went. And that's exactly what I did. And lastly, and most importantly in my position, was I looked at the demographics of my community, uh, a community that I 100% related to, right? When you talk about being working classes was not theoretical for Juana Matias. I'd come from an immigrant background. My dad was an undocumented immigrant when he got here. My parents worked in blue collar uh, factories their entire lives and because of their sacrifices, were able to give me a semblance of the American dream. And I felt that this district rep deserved someone who had lived those experiences and would give those issues and problems we were facing the urgency and attention they deserved. And um, in addition to that, it wasn't just about me. It was about setting a precedent, right? That I believe we achieved. It was about uh, being the first Afro-Latina immigrant who has ever run a viable race at the federal level in the state. And hoping that by doing so, Latinas and young women of color in the state know that they can too. Juana, this, you, tell me you're gonna run again, right? <laughs> I mean, I think when you're, um, when you believe in public service and you understand that you really can impact positive change, that you can address inequities, it's a lifelong commitment. I've been lucky, uh, I'm really lucky and honored that I ended up at Mass Inc. because I feel like I'm continuing to do that work. But yeah, running for public office is something that I see as long-term for me. Great. Um, so I, I have a theory about the expectations of women of color. And we've heard Linda talk about this. We've heard Beth talk about this. And my theory is that women of color, we tend to look younger than we really are, right? And so, and I think as a result, society and organizations don't set very high expectations or any expectations. Um, have you felt that kind of unconscious bias and, and how do you deal with that? Absolutely have, and I know I will continue to, as I was mentioning previously in both phrases, everyone continue to lower the bar for me and say, don't run for state rep, start at the school committee level. Don't run for Congress. You should be running for student uh, for uh, state Senate and do what's convenient. And so it's something that I've always constantly experienced. Um, and 
surprisingly, it sometimes comes from our own communities, Shirley, right? From people that you least expect it. Um, well, at the state house, I'd be in the chamber at times and I'd have in my early months, I'd have security staff come up to me and say, hey, staff cannot be here on the chamber floor. Can you please proceed to, to leave the room? And I'd have to say, well, I'm not staff. You know, I'm the state representative for the 16th Essex district. And these people didn't do this with ill intention. They just hadn't seen a young working class Latina immigrant in the state house yet. And so there I was to show them that it was possible. Um, on every radio station show that I did while I was at Congress and running for Congress, you should, you should drop out of the congressional race and, and, and run for state Senate. And it would have been okay, right? Like this is a fair question. I'm, I'm all about fair questions and I don't negate that. But why aren't you asking this to the other 13 candidates who don't hold public office and who've not, who have not dedicated their life to serving this district? then it would be a fair question. So constantly, constantly have seen how people lower the bar for women of color, especially young women of color and question our capacity. Um, and in retrospect, I'm actually glad they did. And I'm glad that I did not allow them to define my capacity and my vision of leadership. Great, all right, I have to move on, but I wanna ask you one last question, but hopefully we can, you know, go over it quickly, but it's yeah. it's kind of a big question. But maybe you, you will do it. Uh, we'll do it quickly. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about your work at Mass Inc. and how, since your arrival, it's become a much more diverse organization. And so, how does an organization go through that kind of transformation? Well, first, I want to give credit to Mass Inc. They hired me, right? Mm -hmm. A working class Latina from Gateway City. So they clearly had this commitment and they brought me on. And like Beth and both Linda mentioned, I bring my authentic self to my work every single day and, and trying to ensure that the policies that we advocate speak to the needs of our communities and that also speak to my story. So, you know, I've been really proud alongside our CEO um, of the fact that the last out of the last six hires, four have been women of color at Mass Inc. We've made great strides and commitment around this work and bringing on a consulting, um, allocating a portion of our budget to continuing to do this work because it's not just about numbers, it's about also once you bring these people on, Shirley, how are you making them feel included and belonged and like they belong in the organization's culture? And I think we've made great strides and I've been very, very proud to be a part of Mass Inc and, and the work we've been doing around that. That's great. It, often the, the tone is set from the top. So, and uh, right. it's great that Mass Inc. has done that. And, uh, and then you're here to help kind of implement the rest of the strategy. So we're going to have Linda and Beth turn on their cameras, uh, join, join, come back. Great. Excellent. It worked. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I have one question for me and then um, for all of you, and then we'll jump into the audience questions, okay? Uh, so um, I, I want to talk about, um, you know, I, I found in town, like a lot of organizations, uh, they hire and promote white women, and they count that towards their diversity goal. And, um, and at some point, you have a lot of white women at the top. Uh, I know women should be supporting women. Of course, I believe in that. But at, at some point, you start to have a lot of white women at the top, and you have very few women of color in, in the upper echelon. So how do you get organizations to prioritize advancing women of color? Should and I go first? Just jump in. Just jump yeah. in. <laughs> I think there has to be an assessment internally um, in terms of where are we? I think one of the things that I've been kind of really moved by at Mass Inc is we've been like, well, let's look at our board. Let's look at our executive team. Do we practice what we preach? And if we don't, what are we gonna do to change that? And we've made very intentional steps to addressing any areas where we've seen gaps. And I think people at the top, and um, we've done research around this and you look at our gateway cities, nonprofits, they're there to serve those with the greatest needs. You look at their boards and their executive team, all white. You have no perspective, no cultural understanding of the needs of these gateway cities when your boards and your executive teams don't have people of color in them who can really speak to what these lived experiences are. And so holding people accountable and yourselves accountable into, into addressing these issues and in, in meeting metrics. And that's what we've kind of been doing at Mass Inc. And we, we'd hope that people that are at the helm look at their Rolodexes. Because let's think about how boards are created. You reach out to friends. Who are your friends? If you're a white person, predominantly white. So, you know, if your Rolodexes aren't diverse, 
take an effort to make them diverse. And if you can't do that, then reach out to partners and stakeholders, reach out to Linda, reach out to Beth to see if they have people in their pipeline that could be, um, could take advantage of this opportunity. Cause I hate hearing, well, there isn't talent. There is absolute talent. Is, are you doing the right things to find and identify and cultivate that talent? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, cause I think what the wine said is, is, is spot on. And I think it is important for organizations to talk about the value of diverse perspectives in the organization, right? And so it's not just a numbers game and people mm -hmm. are asking organizations to change. Change is hard, they need to know why. And so why is it important to have diverse perspectives and diverse is not just white men and white women, right? What do other people bring and how is that gonna add value to your organization? It may have you reaching out to new clients. It may have you, creative because you have different perspectives and different lived experience thinking about your, your services and your offerings. So I think organizations need to think deeply about why it matters to them and be able to share that with their employees so people start getting on board of, yes, this is why it makes sense. And then I also think, you know, while it's important to reach out to other people, other groups for, you know, recommendations, people of color want to be selected not because they're black, brown, or, or something else, right? I've had plenty of people say, do you know somebody black who can sit on my board? Somebody doesn't want to sit on your board just because they're black. They want to know that they are going to, they're, they're, they're there because they have something to contribute. So what are the skills that you are looking for? What is the, you know, what is the, the value that you're looking for in a board member, you know, skills, services, experiences? And certainly I'm going to think about people I know who are people of color as well as other people who fit that. But it's not, I mean, it's actually insulting for people to say, I'm looking for somebody black, I'm looking for somebody Latinx to sit on my board, who can sit on my board. People want to be there for more than just the race and or ethnicity that they, that they bring. Absolutely, and just, you all said it all. And just to echo and stress, we have talent, right? In communities of color, we know that folks who meet all the requirements, all everything that you're looking for, we have it. And so it's these companies and everyone, not just companies, nonprofits like Juana mentioned and others and municipalities, right? That have to dig deeper and they have to be intentional and say that, you know, we are moving in a new direction. Diversity of thought, no doubt brings in innovation, right? Lives ex lived experiences, people will think of stuff differently than the monolithic group. And so it is critical, um, you know, that we, we start pushing it and no doubt there is talent. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'm going to move into the audience questions. Um, there's a lot of them and I would love to get through a, a lot of them. I mean, we'll get through all of them. But um, so uh, you don't have to feel, everybody doesn't have to answer the question, you know, just one person, maybe a second, but but not everybody has to answer it. So uh, this is among the pre-submitted questions. Um, how do you challenge inappropriate or undermining behavior without being slapped with a disparaging label of being aggressive or angry? So I will say find allies. Often there are allies in your organization who can support you when something happens. And so I would say find an ally because it is, it is hard sometimes being the only one, the only voice, because it's easy for people to say, oh, well, it's so-and-so and they always bring up these issues, right? Mm -hmm. Harder when you have allies and particularly a diverse group of allies who are bringing things forward saying, you know what, given the values of our organization, this behavior doesn't seem to fit. Given the competencies that we're looking for in employees or managers, this behavior doesn't seem to fit. And so you can make your case often by just demonstrating what the company says it stands for or the organization, what they stand for, what their values are and how this behavior doesn't match that. And that with other people also helps to prevent you know, any potential backlash because it's a group of people they're gonna to have to penalize and not just one voice. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. All right, so I, I love this question, That another question from the audience. Um, it would be great to get the speaker's best ideas for attracting a diverse pool of women of color candidates and for getting them to accept job offers. Who I wants think to about attracting a diverse pool of candidates, it's really, it's circumstantial, right? In terms of what is the role and who you, who are you doing outreach? Do you have a Rolodex of diverse candidates you can reach out to? If you don't, 
who are partners within the community that do, right? At Mass Inc, anytime a job posting is coming up, I'm reaching up, out to Amplify Latinx, an organization that deals with Latinos. I'll reach out to Beckma. Do you know anyone in, the, in your pipeline that would be interested or could be a good fit for this role? Um, and that takes more work, but that work is essential and being able to do this. And so that's one way to um, diversify your pool set. Because again, we are all habits, uh, uh, creatures of habit and we go directly to our networks. Our networks are limited. So it's about how do you create the expansion of that? And I think that's an intentional way that I've seen has yielded great results for us at Mass Inc. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And if you're thinking of colleges and universities, you know, it's not just going to a college for, you know, going to the job fair and setting up, right? It's going after the affinity groups, right? There are black students in these colleges and universities. And we have so many here in Massachusetts, right? And all over the country. There are Latinx, you know, Asian, Native American. I mean, our students are in universities too, right? And there's the Black Engineers organization. There's so many organizations out there. So for folks to say, you know, I couldn't find anyone or wow, I couldn't really find someone that meets the requirements. You know, I don't buy that, right? Is that we have to go deeper and creating the pipeline is there. We just have to make sure that the pipeline is coming directly into the companies and organizations that we're part of. And it can't just be on people of color making that commitment and saying we're, cause we're in the positions, yes, we're gonna do it, but we need allies too, as Beth was saying, you know, to be in the work. And I think again, this is the direction that this moment, this movement is asking for. And everyone's been talking about this, but now it's about the action, right? Like when we bring people in, is the culture, is this a really inclusive culture where you can bring black and Latinx and Asian all you want, but if folks are not looking up and saying hello and making people feel that they're part of a team, that they can share their thoughts and ideas and being creative and really trying to elevate the company, that, then people will walk. And so that's also an important part as well. And I think there's a role that philanthropies play in this. Um, I think you, uh, Linda, maybe you share the same concern, but you know, running a campaign. Who are the kids that can come and take free time, have access to resources because their parents offer it to them? It's usually white volunteers. Sure. So our youth don't get exposed to this and public service is not a vehicle for them because they're huge barriers, right? They, they have to help at home. They have to have a job that provides a mean. So, you know, if you're a philanthropy, these kinds of programs matter, right? Like how do we provide youth of color? How do we create that pipeline? And that starts by creating access to opportunity. And the way that opportunity exists for white youth is not the same for someone of color. So, you know, how do multiple partners look at the way they support initiatives that could yield huge results, right, if we if we provide funding. So there are a, a, quite a few questions around allyship. Um, and so I'm gonna try to whittle them down to two questions. One is, uh, as a man, how can I support women in the workplace, especially when there is a culture and system set up to benefit men? So I, a, a couple of things come to mind. I think, you know, making sure you illuminate the practices that you think are disadvantaging women in other groups and say that, right? If you're in an organization, you can say this policy, this practice, you know, it's disadvantaging other groups. This is how let's change it. So that's one. The second is to sponsor women. It is so important. People talk, you know, a lot about sponsorship and, and what it means is that you are advocating for someone in the organization or someone that you have that you know um, when they're not in the room as well as when they are in the room, right? How do you really think about if an opportunity comes up in your organization and you know that there are several qualified women, how do you make sure they're considered for that role? How do you advocate for them? And so you're really sponsoring um, their, uh, their, their careers. And then the third is when you are in meetings with women, and this happens often, where a woman will say something and it's as though she hasn't spoken at all. And then if a man says it, then it's like, oh, that's the best idea since sliced bread. So how do you, when that happens, say, oh, you know what? Linda had a great idea. I don't know if everybody heard that, but I'm gonna repeat that idea because it was so good. Um, and, and be able to do that so you're, you're ensuring that women are visible in your organization. So those are three things to think about. 
Beth, I'm so glad you addressed the last question about um, speaking up for women or, or being an ally in meetings for women, because that also was a, another question that came up quite a bit <laughs> from the audience. So one last question, that this is interesting uh, on this issue of allyship. Um, how can white women be better allies to women of color when we are also discounted by men in power in many organizations? I talk, I'll, I'll wait, I have an answer, but I'll, I'll <laughs> wait in case Juana or Linda wanna go first. No, go ahead, Beth. <laughs> um, go ahead, Beth, I'll go after, go ahead. Sure, so for me, this comes down to a couple of things. I, I think we have to get rid of the notion that there are a few positions. And so, right, there's you know two positions for women. And so I can't help other women because I have one of those two. Mm -hmm. okay. Part of it is that we have to be willing to think about how do we not accept that there are only two roles for women, right? How do we push to make sure that there are more? And that means we have to work together to do that. The second is to not assume that our experiences are shared or the same, right? Some of the challenges that I face as a Black woman are different than some of the challenges that I know my white uh, peers face, right? So how do we have honest conversations about what those differences are. Because often people don't ask me what I need, they assume that what I need is what they need and it's not always the case. And then they get offended if I say that, right? Because then it's sort of, well, you know, it, it feels like it's charity <laughs> because they've offered to help me out. And I said, that's not what I need. And then they're offended, right? Mm -hmm. Have an honest dialogue. And so part of it too is not being upset if you know your help was not what a woman of color needed. Ask her what she needs. Don't assume you know. Ask if you want to be helpful. And then be willing to do what she's asked if you're putting it out there. And not if it's inconvenient, you won't do it anymore. Sometimes it takes you know being inconvenient to really be an ally and to support somebody. Um, and you need to be able to have an honest dialogue about that and not, you know, fall into tears on either side because you can't move forward if you can't have the conversation. And often I feel, and we talk about this in my organization, so I feel comfortable saying this, that a lot of white women uh, fall to being nice, right? And so we don't really have the conversation we need to have because we're so worried about being, they're so worried about being nice mm -hmm. that I can't be honest because then I might hurt their feelings which to me isn't trying to be mean, it's just I'm stating what I need. And so that needs to be able to go both ways. And we don't have to worry about just being nice because we're not gonna get anywhere just being nice. It doesn't mean to be mean and hurtful. You can be respectful in the conversation, but you can speak your truth. Very good, Beth. I mean, Beth hit it all. And to say, I'll add as well that by helping women of color doesn't mean that you're giving something up. Right, so back to Beth in terms of there's uh, several positions, right, that can be available, no doubt that are available for women. Um, but I do think, you know, that's a piece that that has to be worked on in terms of um, women in general, because we talk about diversity, um, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, and even when you look at the, the gender number, majority are white women being hired. And so this is where data and metrics are important, but we have to peel back the onion, right? So when we're looking at gender, it's important to look at the ethnic makeup, right? And this is how companies are going to be able to see, okay, where is it that they need to focus and elevating? Um, there's some real conversations that have to happen agree with Beth, doesn't have to be adversarial, right? Um, but I can give you an example really quickly in the legislature, you know, when we were talking about the gender equity, right, the gender gap equity, you know, the number we kept on hearing is 70 cents, women are making 70 cents to the white man's dollar. And the 70 cents was white women, because black slash African American women were making 67 cents to the white man's $1. And Latino, Latina women were making 54 cents to the white man's $1. And so that's the issue as well. As we throw out a 70 cents number, it's being intentional and in saying, wait a minute, who are we talking about? You know, what group are we focusing on? And once we could get down into that and having the conversations, real conversations and calling it out as well, right? When we're going to, you know, I, I was on a panel, a 2020, you know, a women on boards panel. And it was great. I was on the panel because I'm on the Eversource board and we're talking about it. And I look around the room and I stop and I say, okay, let's take a moment and look around the room. Like there's a 200 women here and only two women of color in the whole room. 
And here we're talking about board diversity, but that, that wasn't really about women of color, diversity coming on boards, right? And so this is where, you know, we have to be honest, we have to put it out there. And I don't think putting it out there, um, going back to that question, challenging inappropriate behaviors, putting it out doesn't mean we're angry or aggressive, right? We are trying to tackle this issue now in 2020. I have four children, two of them are young girls, right? I mean, so it can be better for them, you know, 10, 20, 15, 30 years from now. So, you know, this is the work we have to do. And these are warriors right here on this panel who are doing the work every day. So it's exciting. Um, here's another question from the live audience. Um, in transitioning from one role to another, how were you able to gauge not only if the role if the role and the responsibilities fit you, but if the company had the cultural competency to embrace all of who you are as a woman and person of color? So how do you vet? Because I guess it, the, 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 it, it's almost assuming that some of you, you, you've been brought into a room where it is tends to be white, it tends to be perhaps male dominated. So how do you make sure it's the right fit for you and how you can succeed? I think that takes some time, right? I came uh, from the state house where Linda could relate and it's like our agenda in our office, we create the values and vision of what we aspire to accomplish with our staff. And so then joining Mass Inc where there is already a structure and culture and a board, um, it took some time, right, um, to assess and get an assessment of the organization, its culture, its history, um, and what its mission was, and were we fulfilling that? So with time, I started to find my mold. My mold. I felt bold in questioning practices that I thought weren't leading to the best results. I felt comfortable uh, proposing new ways of doing things, assessing. I know we're talking a lot about women of color reaching um important roles, but what are we doing with our programming? And is it inclusive? And are there other ways we can be elevating voices of color? So, you know, ass assessing every program and our operations in a way that then allowed me to propose, well, these are the new ideas. And you're not going to get everyone to jump off and say, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're with you. Let's go this way. But with time and bringing different approaches and visions and, you know, showing the data, um, people come on and you want that buy-in, right? You want people to see why this work matters and why elevating X or Y is important. And so for me, it took time, um, but it was great because in that time I was evolving and learning into my role. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'll say really quick that, um, you know, the work, it's continuing the work, which is amazing, right? As a state Senator and so forth, working on access and opportunity, how do we strengthen small businesses and to be able to come into Suffolk and to work with John and the team, um, someone, him in particular, who is focused and committed to communities, right? And building communities, um, but more importantly has done a lot in Roxbury. And so I've been able to transition into this company where we're focusing on businesses that are owned by people of color and women and veterans that are in construction to make sure that they have an access to the pie, right? That they're participating on our, on our jobs, that they're able to thrive and build the wealth because it's also the workforce. Yes, there's boots on the ground, but for us, it's also how are we building businesses, businesses in our communities that tend to hire, you know, people of color. You hire people of color own businesses, they are gonna hire people of color, right? That is what is happening. And so for us, there's been a, a concerted effort um, to do that work and to build the capacity of these businesses so they're able to bid on their own, right? And not just be the second or third or fourth level subcontractor, but they could be the prime on our jobs. And so I've been blessed really to be able to come into this company that believes in community, not just here in Boston, though we're in Roxbury, we're headquartered here, but all over the country in the other offices as well. You know, working with young people and high school students, right? Showing them that construction is just not a hammer and nail anymore, right? It's innovation, it's technology. We're doing 3D modeling. We're doing so many innovative things and to be able to plug young people um, into that work, to know that there's an opportunity in this field and to really create the pipeline into the office is, is what I've been able to do. And so it's been quite an exciting two and a half years, which I can't believe it went by that quickly. <laughs> so I have, we have about um, six minutes left. 
time flew. I want to try to get in two more questions. Okay. So, but this is one question for Beth and then one wrap up question. Okay. Beth, we had a question from the audience. This is about your earlier remarks about um, style and, uh, you know, your management style and said, would Beth mind saying more on how she wants to come across as, a, as assertive versus aggressive? Yeah, I mean, I want to be assertive, not aggressive. I mean, and depending on who it is, they can, you know, people can define the same behavior it, with the same two, you know, adjectives, right? So um, what I try to be as a manager and as a human being is direct. Um, I, when I was, I don't like to read people's minds. And so as a manager, I never wanted to have to, I don't want my staff to have to read my mind and guess what I really mean. So I try to be as direct as possible. I try to be direct, but kind, right? You don't need to be mean about it. I try to provide feedback so that people can grow and learn. That's the only way you're going to advance. Um, I don't think of myself particularly as aggressive, but there will be situations where aggressive might be the appropriate term to use, right? But I think one can be assertive, which for me is more of standing up for, for who you are, for your values, for your principles, for me, it's for my, my organization. I'm not going to let people, you know, talk disparagingly at all about my organization or my staff. Like I'm going to, you know, assert myself on behalf of my organization, on behalf of my team, on my family. So yeah, there are times where, I, you know, I'm going to be assertive, but I don't think it's necessarily aggressive. And one point I, I, I do want to share for people, you know, one thing, one advi piece of advice I got years ago was do as much as you can to save up money so that you can take opportunities and if they don't work, it's okay. Mm -hmm. right? And so that's hard, particularly as people of color because we're often underpaid. <laughs> um, but if there are ways to save, then you can take a chance. And that was part for me in taking on the role as interim. I was not guaranteed that that interim title would go away. And so I talked to my partner and we had been saving and we said, okay, you know, if it doesn't work out, hopefully we have enough saved that I can have an off ramp to look for something else. But I had the you know, financial uh, flexibility to feel like, okay, if it doesn't work, I have something to fall back on. And that's, I think something important for everyone, but particularly for people of color, for us to be able to feel like we have the opportunity to take risks um, uh, with, with jobs, because we don't always know if it's going to work out or not, but we can push ourselves if we feel like we've got something to fall, fall back on. So I encourage people, particularly people of color, if at all possible, to try to save up some, some money so that if there's a situation that doesn't work out the way that you want, that you don't have to stay in a job that doesn't make you happy. That's great. All right, one last question for me, for me, and you guys have like 45 seconds each, okay? okay. <laughs> so if there's one thing an organization or someone watching this panel can do to help elevate women of color, what would that be? Or Juana, you go first. <laughs> I would say, uh, first start off with an internal assessment of your organization. Are there people in the pipeline you should be looking to? How are you providing support mechanisms for them? And if there are vacancies that are coming up, how are you becoming intentional and in making sure that your workforce is gonna be a diverse one? Um, and speak up, speak up. That's the only way change happens. Who's next? <laughs> Yeah, I'll go. I'll, the only thing I'll add is to you think about what, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Not only what is happening in your organization, but what are you personally doing to support women of color in your organization, in your sphere of influence, in your, in your life? Like, what are you doing? Because we all can take action to do something. Absolutely. And finally, just do an assessment of the team, right? What are you doing? Are you just tolerating? people of color in your environment? Are you just, they're in your company because they're talented and they got there and they got hired, right? It's not enough to just tolerate someone, but are you championing them, right? Are you taking them under your wing? Are you taking the time to just say, you know, here's some things you can get involved in. Here are some teams that are working on different issues to move the company forward in terms of the business. You know, would love to put you on a team to work with others to learn how it works. So it's really stepping out of your comfort zone and embracing people of color because we have so much women of color in particular, because this is what the panel is about. But, you know, we have so much to offer and so much much, um, you know, to give 
in terms of where the company is going to be growing, even nonprofit sector as well, of course. But, you know, it, it's going to be everyone really coming to the table to have these conversations. Yes, they're uncomfortable, but we got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, okay? This is the only way we're going to move forward. Well, thank you, Juana. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Linda. I, as a woman of color, I feel empowered and inspired from your conversation today. I'm going to hand it back to Brittany, Brittany Manganar to say goodbye. All right, I was muted, sorry. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, I love the way you structured this conversation and thank you very much to our speakers, Beth, Juana, and Linda for the insightful, inspiring, and honest dialogue. Your passion is infectious. As reflected in the conversation, it is imperative that we elevate women of color and address gender and ethnic disparity across various industries and sectors here in Massachusetts and across the country. UBS has always valued supporting women on their path to financial independence by partnering with them and using our expertise and best in class financial solutions for every stage in our clients' lives. UBS recently launched the Luminary Fellowship Program, which is aimed at supporting businesses owned by women of color who have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic by delivering the necessary tools in which to rebuild, maintain, manage and grow their companies. With initiatives like this, we strive to assist women of color in succeeding with their businesses, especially during such a difficult time and encourage others to follow suit. Thank you again for your time this afternoon and discussing how to support women in the workplace and advance women of color. Our next program will be held at noon on November 16th, and we will be discussing navigating tough times and the future of entrepreneurship. We look forward to seeing you there.